All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the session, um, designing Drupal experiences with Figma. Um, before I get started, I had a few questions for the group. Um, raise your hand if you went to the Pantheon event last night. <laughs> All right, well, congrats on making it here this early. I'm really impressed. I didn't go, because I was nervous about this, so. Um, who here is a designer? Okay, nice. Um, developers? Okay, a lot of developers. Great. Well, I think um, really everyone's going to get something out of this. Um, we're keeping it really high level about what Figma is and how we can hand it off, how designers hand things off to developers. So first, a little bit about me. Hello, I'm Matt Curtin. I'm the director of design here at Phase 2. Um, this is my third DrupalCon, uh, but first time uh, actually speaking. So yeah, <clears throat> we'll see how it goes. This clicker is also not working very well, so it is what it is. Um, so I'm sure you've seen this slide before or heard about phase two at some point. Uh, if not, I'm very concerned. You need to go to booth 333 immediately after this. There are huge glowing trees. You can't miss it. Um, and talk to some of our team and, and learn more about us. Um, but we're a digital product agency. We're passionate about the customer experience and grounded in data insights. And we've been around for uh, over two decades. Uh, here are some stats really illustrating our uh, commitment to Drupal. Uh, over 85 developers on staff and over 1,000 uh, Drupal developers, or Drupal projects that have been built. So a lot of commitment to Drupal. I wanted to start off uh, the session talking about the old days of design handoffs. I wanted to tell a, a brief story. Um, the design and creative team has worked really hard with the client to um, establish design compositions for their next Drupal build. Um, everyone's excited. We've been through rounds of revisions. Uh, we have a, um, a final design approved by the client. We're ready to start building, right? Uh, we pass off the design files to the developers, and here come the questions. How do I inspect the designs? Uh, in this case, we were using Adobe Illustrator to create the designs. We had these beautiful colors in CMYK, uh, and you know everything was looking great. The client's excited. Um, developers get the files, they get a PDF. I can't inspect these designs. How do I grab assets? How do I look at things like padding, font size, things like that? Next question. Uh, what is the, what, which file is the main source of truth? <laughs> we tip, we've all seen uh, a folder of files like this. Um, we're going back and forth with the client. There's a lot of hands in the pot. Um, designers helping out with the files. Um, you know. The developers see this, this folder and they're like, what am I looking at here? I'm sure we've all seen a, uh, a file named final, final, final before. Um, can UI elements be standardized? While every composition might look beautiful and consistent, uh, the developers start digging in and they find um, really subtle differences with things like buttons and card treatments and uh, you know, some things have borders, some don't. Um, sometimes the icons on the left or right. Uh, how do we standardize some of these components that we're building to, to do things faster? So the designers left kind of figuring out how to consolidate all of these treatments. Uh, where can I find images, icons, and, and other assets? We use a lot of images that were on brand, a lot of icons, background graphics, things like that. All of these are kind of locked into the design file, and the developers have to keep coming to the designer to ask for different assets. Um, really, the designers spending a lot of time doing that. What are the various interactive, interactive states? So, we, we might have designs that show the active menu drop downs and, and other states on primary components, but other subtle animations and uh, interactions like a button hover or a focus state aren't really documented anywhere, so the developers are left kind of assuming what those treatments might actually be. How does a responsive grid impact component padding and sizing? Um, we, we create several desktop, tablet, and mobile compositions, but again, uh, there's a lot of edge cases with devices, and how do these um, components scale and expand based on the device that they're rendering on? Um, again, leaving the designer to do yet more compositions to show that breakdown. So at the end of the day, um, the designer was excited to move on to either the next project or continuing to create compositions that might be added in post-launch. Uh, instead, they're spending a lot of time working with the developers to, to actually hand off everything. Everyone's frustrated. Um, how can we improve this process? Uh, in the recent years, um, the industry has been flooded with uh, several design and prototyping tools to make both the designers' lives easier and the de developers. Uh, tools like Sketch, Adobe XD, uh, and Framer, just to name a few. 
um, from the, for the developer handoff, uh, things like Avacode, Zeppelin, Envision Design System Manager, uh, all allow you to upload design files um, to share with your development team. Um, the creative team at uh, phase two has really adopted Figma as our main uh, creative tool um, for everything that we do on the creative side and also develop in the handoff. So um, what features make this uh, such a powerful tool and why did we want to adopt that? Um, before I get into that, I have some starter definitions just so we we'll make sure we're speaking the same language as we go through these slides. We'll start with a component. Uh, so a component, components are elements that you can reuse across your designs. Uh, they help create and manage consistent designs across all of your projects. So again, they're just reusable objects that you can use throughout all of your design compositions. They allow you to work faster because you're just reusing the same components and editing content within them. Um, and they introduce consistency and rules to follow for both designers and developers as we're working uh, on both sides of either the web project or the compositions. Here is a giant button, an example of a base component. Um, here we can see, you know, keeping things very simple with this component, we have a border radius, background, and a base color and font def uh, defined there. Um, and the text is centered within the button, so just defining those base properties. Next is a variant. Variants provide a way to organize and combine similar components into one overarching component set. So with variants, we can introduce uh, subtle changes to a component like the size, the content, the mode, or the state, so a hover or focus state, for example. Um, it really helps keep all of our complex components organized um, when we pass things off to the front-end devs. So here's an example of that same button, but now we've added some variants to that. So um, we've added some support for uh, potentially adding an icon to the button, uh, maybe a hover or a focus state and even introducing a secondary button treatment for a background and changing the text color of that button. The, the final definition is the design system. So a design system is a complete set of standards intended to manage design at scale using reusable components and patterns. So um, we, when we think about a design system, think about the client that's coming to us. Um, they've spent a lot of time and effort um, establishing their brand uh, and and you know, a lot of time and money um, doing that. So as a web designer and developer, I wanna make sure that I protect that brand as much as possible as we take that and move it to the digital space. Um, when we're working in design systems, it allows us to, to expand and grow this system over time and work more efficiently as a team. So why are we uh, recommending Figma for all of this? First, it's fast and platform agnostic. Um, meaning anyone with any device can open up a Figma file and, and start digging in, um, whether you're using uh, Apple machine, Windows, or, or even Linux. Uh, it allows for real-time design collaboration. So many designers can be working in the same design, the design file at the same time. Um, we can even click someone's avatar at the top of the page and observe that designer working. We often do that internally a lot when we're um, collaborating on either a design review or just even a quick sync. Um, like Drupal, it has a lot of community support. There's thousands of plugins available that allow you to install it quickly and use it, um, whether it's for designing faster um, or you know, checking for accessibility, things like that. There's a lot of plugins available. Um, next level components, we'll talk a lot, lot about this today, but um, really building interactive components and defining states all in one place. Uh, client feedback and commenting, so not just exclusive to clients, but really anyone can jump into a file, identify an item that they want to have a comment to or have a question about, and there can be some real-time collaboration and discussion about that, that uh, element and how it can change. Uh, Built-in developer handoff. So uh, even as we're designing, before designs are approved, we can get developers in there, and they can start inspecting elements that we're introducing into the design system and really check things like font size, spacing, um, everything, color, all the things that we're introducing into the design um, right there. And um, we'll go through that, this inspect tab that we see here as well. Um, before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit to the designers in the room about some of the, the more design uh, features here. Um, global styles, so Figma allows um, designers to establish reusable properties as I'm starting to create my, des my uh, design system and my compositions. Things like color, typography, effects, and layout grids can all be saved. Um, as I'm working in my style library. 
Uh, and I can, and by doing this and, and taking this approach by defining all my color sets and things like that, I can quickly change uh, these prop properties globally across all my compositions. Uh, content components. So again, we've talked about what a component is. Uh, we can establish these base components as we're working and creating these compositions. So no longer are we copying and pasting group layers and, and just reusing them and, and iterating them on compositions. We're changing them globally across all of the compositions we create, taking more of an atomic uh, design approach here. So again, starting simple with a component like the button we saw, and then introducing those, that something like that into a more complex um, nested or slotted component that we can continue to iterate. A pattern library. So um, I'll give a quick demo of what this looks like, but all of the components and base styles are all organized in a library. Um, and they're available to the entire design team uh, as they're working and collaborating on a design project. Um, there's also multiple library support for larger organizations that have a much bigger brand or subbrands. So in this example, we can see the libraries on the left side. Uh, I then click that and I can see all of the colors, the typography, and things like that that I've already defined in my design system as I'm working on these compositions. I can then grab and use some of these components from this library. Let's say um, I want to close that and jump into an individual button. I want to change the hover state on my primary button. I want to darken that just to make it a little bit more prominent that I'm hovering over it. I can then see I've changed something in the library. I can then look at that, that change. I can see that I've not only impacted the button component, but also some of the more complex components that use it. I can add a note about what I'm changing. So I'm changing that button style. I can update that and publish that to the library. Once I publish that, uh, in this case, the library is local to this Figma file. But if I have that library shared to other files, all of those will, will grab that change. And designers working that file can see what I changed and pull that in. Um, auto layout, great feature um, for designers to really align and uh, things faster. Uh, you can apply auto layout to not just individual components to have consistent spacing between layers, for example, but you can also group components. Um, so in this case, I have a grid of cards. I can make sure that the spacing on the top, on the between them, on and below them are consistent throughout. Um, in this example, I've applied auto layout to the uh, entire frame for the find a location page, and what this is doing is making sure that. Uh, as I add and remove sections of content, um, the entire frame will grow and collapse. Um, I'm also applying auto layout to the overall location card grid, um, just to make sure ev all of the rows of cards are, are consistently spaced. Let's say the client wants to add more uh, te uh, location teasers to the, uh, the first page of the listing. I can continue to add these rows, and my design expands as I continue to add them. Uh, interactive prototyping. So oftentimes, uh, looking at flat design files isn't really enough. Um, we need to, to add some prototyping so that um, both the client and the developer understands how, how the end user will interact with something. Um, Smart Anim Animate is, is a tool in Figma that in introduces smooth transitions um, between components, just so it really mimics the uh, animated experience that we're going to have as the end user on the, the built out app. Um, it allows us also to define flows um, that the user would take for a conversion, um, like making a purchase or, or finding uh, care information. Um, it also provides a comprehensive list of triggers. So um, whether I'm touching something um, on click, hover, um, all of those triggers are, are all very easy to use here in the prototyping tool. Um, in this example, you can see I have a lot of app screens. Um, with various goals and providing information to a particular patient who's looking for care or looking for a location. Uh, in this case, I've actually done some prototyping in the individual component itself for the menu. So I can click here, go to the prototyping tab, and I can see all of the various prototyping that I've already done. I can go to the main menu hamburger and see that you know that's being prototyped to open up here. I can also do a lot of prototyping to mimic a drill down menu as well. So. Um, and once I'm done with that, I can also even do some, some prototyping in the artboards themselves so that um, the client, when they're, they're demoing this, or the developer, when they're looking at this, they can see that these things are prototyped and clickable to various other pages, and they can really see the flow there that's defined. 
once I'm done with all my prototyping, I can hit play, and I can actually prototype this directly on a, a device to really give that feel, and I can start driving around. So if this is shared with a client or developer, I can really understand how I can go and see my care options. I can click some of these accordions and see how information is organized there. Um, and I can just drive around and scroll to maybe the home page, clicking the logo, going back, and seeing all the various sections and controls. Some of these are prototyped and some of these are not, um, just to kind of demonstrate like the fixed menu at the top and things like that. I can then click the menu. We can see all that prototyping work that I've done in that interactive component to drill down into various pages. Let's say I want to go to campus maps and see all the various location options. If I have an appointment somewhere, I can quickly also click one of these locations. Let's say I have an appointment at the main medical center campus. I can get walking directions, go to the campus map, things like that. Uh, and it just allows me to drive around and really experience um, how the design was, was really intended. I can also you know, just go further, drilling down into wellness services and access you know, healthy eating, um, fitness recommendations and resources, and um, performance training. Stakeholder presentations. We just saw kind of a quick demo of something like that, but Figma allows us to break out of the, the artboards and the frames and present in a more polished way to clients and then also follow that up with some uh, share links as well. Um, and we also allow, com it allows commenting and feedback directly in Figma so we keep all of that feedback in one place. Uh, in this example, you can see we're presenting a table of contents to the client so that they can see all of the various pages that we've created for the various content types in Drupal. I can click uh, on any of those and immediately start interacting with something like the home page. I can see how the main menu works, see how the search uh, can work when I open that up. Um, and then I can just start driving around and, and exploring uh, the home page. Uh, and we can really see how some of these interactive components uh, come to life as I drive around. Um, again, similar to the uh, app we saw before, I can uh, drill down into sub pages. Um, we didn't list all of the services, but we can really see how I can go through and scroll and jump back up. We even prototyped something like the live chat at the bottom, uh, just to really see how that's fixed to the bottom of the screen and how that experience will work. We can go to other landing pages, um, like getting information about my chart, uh, and, and really just driving around. And you can see how um, we use this for actual client presentations. We drive around and show them how it works, and then we just share a quick Figma link. They have the table of contents, um, and they can experience it for themselves uh, offline. Um, if things aren't prototyped, they can use the left and right arrows just to quickly go through some of these other pages uh, and, and see the other uh, compositions that were created. And if there's a change that they want, um, they can quickly hit the C key and put a comment anywhere. So let's say I want to change the treatment of the clear filters building. I don't necessarily like the red. Um, that comment goes right to me. I can then uh, respond directly to that or simply make the change. Um, accessibility is a really important aspect to everything that we do at phase two. Um, and Figma really helps us there with some accessibility plugins. Um, the things that I really care about as I'm working is um, the proper color contrast, uh, touch targets, so the 48 by 48 pixels on, on a mobile device is really important. Uh, and then text and line height, making things, making sure text is really legible and readable on all devices. Um, there's several plugins that are available that make sure, uh, allow us to test things for WCAG uh, AA and AAA. Um, we always have a AA standard, but AAA is like the goal to strive to. Um, so things like Able, uh, Contrast, and Stark are, are three plugins we really recommend for that. You can see here, um, I'm using Able to test the color contrast on the menu that we just saw. Um, and I'm passing with AA and AAA on all different font sizes. I have the proper contest, contrast ratio. And I can even get a preview of how someone with colorblindness would, would be digesting that. Um, and I can toggle on different types of colorblindness as well. Now let's get into some of the developer features as well for our handoffs. Um, first, I'm going to do a tour of the inspect tab. Um, really quick, we can see at the top, um, I've shared a link with the developer. They immediately start jumping in. I inspect the button. I can see at the top of the screen that it's using that primary button component. Um, I can click that at the top and jump right into that main component and check it out more and see the variants. Um, I can see that that button is part of the hero banner component as well, and I can see what variant that is. 
Uh, next is the properties. The main properties we care about here are really the padding. Um, and you know, potentially, if I could dig deeper, I can inspect things like font size and other and things like that. You'll also notice that as I'm digging deeper, I'm seeing um, some guides up here that show me spacing between elements. No more redlining for designers. I don't have to um, put guides on the page and help uh, developers see what the spacing between elements. Everything's really done in the app as they're inspecting things. Um, and I completely skip what this is showing, but I can I inspect something like the button and see that I'm using the white color. I can see how the naming convention that and how I'm organizing that color. And depending on how I'm developing, I can grab the hex color RGB values um, and, and various other options. Um, typography is another thing. I, again, I can see how I'm organizing all my headings. I'm currently using the, uh, the large H2 here. And again, we can see that space in bet um, between the image and the text group. Um, things like shadows as well. Um, if an element has a shadow, you can see I'm using a, a consistent card shadow throughout. So if I make a change to that uh, core shadow, every element using it will, will have that change as well. And finally, um, Figma does allow CSS uh, to print. So um, this would not be something you would copy and paste and actually use, but it does have some suggested properties and, and um, things that at least get development started. And finally, most importantly, uh, a lot of the assets can be clicked and exported directly. Um, in this case, we're exporting an SVG directly out of Figma. Um, the responsive grid, we, we talked about that uh, before, just defining all of our, our different grid styles It'll, and make sure that we're aligning things properly in the designs uh, and the developers have a good idea of, of consistent spacing throughout um, for grids and other layouts. Um, one, one big question that we get uh, from the development team all the time is, oh, you've accounted for really small devices and how things um, get smaller, but what about the ultra-wide breakpoints? Um, so that's something we also define, is how does the theme expand to those large monitors, those TV screens that people commonly use now? Um, design system documentation. So along with the compos compositions and the component library, we take it one step further and actually put together some component sheets just showing all the various states and variants that a component might have. This also allows us to put design notes and guidelines to the developers when we're passing things off to them. So here's an example of that. Again, we can see we're using that table of contents formatter, format. Um, so I can dive, in, dive into my uh, core components, like looking at colors, all of the brand colors and documentation there. Um, my typography, so all of the, the headings that I'm using, you'll see there's just notes throughout I'm um, really defining those sizes in pixels and rems. Um, and then I can also see uh, things like links and paragraph content, along with hover states, defining those um, active and hover states on elements as well. Um, things like form elements, things like that, alert banners, um, and the buttons. Really just putting all of those out in the open and defining the, all of the focus states uh, and edge cases that a developer would need to account for when they're building these things. Um, I can also jump back to the table of contents at any time and go into some things like the WYSIWYG content, seeing how we intend columns to work, if we want to have image aligned with uh, a call to action, um, and things like that, along with our um, reference cards. Now keep in mind that these names also go exact, uh, pair directly with how the developers are naming them in their design system on the front end. Um, just so the client knows when we refer to a com uh, component what we're talking about, um, and then the developers, everybody's on the same page. If we if we say full vi video teaser, we know exactly um, what I'm talking about there, and, and and we're all speaking the same language about components there. So um, at at a certain point, when the designs are getting close to approved, or even when we have that round one design presented, um, we're already starting to transition the design source of truth. Um, from Figma to uh, Outline and to our web components that we're building on the front end. Um, so in this graphic, we can kind of see how things are talking to each other. We have the design system working in Figma. We have our, our Outline system, which is our web components that our team uses internally. And then we have everything kind of documented in Storybook and pulled together there. So designers and developers can really work together and see how things uh, come to life. Uh, so here we see one uh, example we have a component in Figma, um, and it's time to transition this to Drupal and to Storybook. As so we can see, 
I've pulled that component into Storybook. As a designer, I'm jumping in here and, and testing things out, making sure everything's consistent. Image size is consistent, the sizing and everything that I had defined in Figma. We can also see that things are being used uh, as slots or variants um, here as well. So I can, I can change this control to change the color directly to the green primary instead of the blue. I can also change settings like the alignment of the text and image uh, right here in Storybook and see that come to life. I can also toggle on the code view so I can see how that code would translate to Drupal. None of this is pulling in actual uh, Drupal vari variables or any actual Drupal type code. It's all just plain old HTML that we're gonna be using to, to plug into Drupal and build that component. So here's a preview of, of Storybook. So as a designer, I'm jumping in here and I can really see everything's housed in here. So all my various button styles, I can interact with those elements. I can view the code of those elements. Um, and then I can jump into some more complex components as well uh, and really dig deeper um, into the Storybook instance. Uh, just so as I'm digging, as I'm looking at the interactivity, I can you know, collaborate with the developer and, and make subtle changes to make sure things are consistent from what we're seeing in Figma. Um, really, we, we wanna account for all of the edge cases here, so if we added a bunch of buttons, so I might like talk about some of the padding between those buttons there. And then when I jump into Drupal on the staging site, I can, there's no surprises. I know exactly what I'm getting when we, when we start adding some of the real content in Drupal. Um, we're all on the same page. Uh, with, with how these components look. Um, so to talk a little bit more about Outline, um, Outline's a set of tools and best practices for developing a design system with platform agnostic web components. Um, so really, at the end of the day, it's simply JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Um, I'm not gonna go too far in depth with, with Outline, but Jake Schron, um, our senior software architect, gave a great talk on Tuesday about Outline, and um, I definitely encourage you to go to our booth 333 um, and check him out at 2 p.m. He's gonna be giving a, uh, a demo uh, about outline. So any designer, developer, anyone, um, it's, a, it's a great um, demo. So what outline provides, again, talked about platform agnostic web components, um, things that we can reuse from project to project. From a design perspective, um, I can see all of those base components and I have a good idea when I'm designing um, you know, what, is, what am I doing that's gonna maybe introduce either a new component that we have to talk about adding to outline, or is there something that we can do to maybe extend it? But really, I have my baseline for, for all the components. There's probably eight, about 80 components that I can choose from. Um, and again, we, we can, you know, build that internally over time as we run into more edge cases for, for the needs of, of uh, new components. Once we add one, we can use it and extend it across any project. So we can develop faster and quicker. Uh, and another good thing is it's, it's available on GitHub. So you can jump into that link, uh, GitHub phase two slash outline, and really just see the code base and see the, the base components that we're already working with. So what's next? Well, we've already done a lot with Figma, um, and it's really ingrained in our, in our processes. But what, what, where do we wanna go next with it? Um, Figma branching. So when we talk about branching, this is the same exact concept for the developers um, as we would do with, with GitHub. We would make a feature branch off of our develop, let's say, um, it's, and we can make changes, code changes to that, and then we can test it and we can merge it right back in to our main code base. You can do the same thing with Figma. Um, several designers can be working on a complex design system. Let's say I wanna make a change to a button. I feature that off. I, make a, a merge request, I can check and see if there's any conflicts with another designer that's working in the system, and then I can commit that to the main master uh, design system. Um, we wanna introduce more animation and movement. Um, prototyping and smart animation really only gets us so far, but there's tools like Principle and Af After Effects that allow you to upload your designs to them and really create more engaging videos and animations and transitions as I scroll through a design. Um, it's really where we want to go, for mainly for client presentations, to, to really show them uh, how that design is going to come to life on the front end. Design tokens. Um, so we've talked a little bit about design tokens in a past presentation for Outline. It's really where we want to go. Um, design tokens is not really a new concept, but um, we're really limited uh, in these design tools as what type of tokens we have access to. Um, 
they're really everything that we, everything that we do in the design system can be turned into a design token. So like we're talking outline, uh, it's a platform agnostic way for design to communicate directly with development through JSON. Um, each of these variables contains an individual design decision. So spacing, color, typography, shadows, and blurs, all can be documented in an individual token. Um, the goal is to define properties in an atomic way. Um, there can be options for, uh, there can be either option tokens or alias tokens. Option tokens define the value, uh, for example, that hex color, while alias tokens define the purpose. So um, a CTA background or a button. Um, so we can see here in this example, we have blue 400, which is used to define that hex color for the blue. Um, but in, in a traditional way, I'd be applying that blue 400 to my headings, my buttons, everything. So let's say I wanted to make a change to just the CTA background color. Um, I can't just change that blue because that would change everything. So um, I would change that individual token to target just that element. So it's, it's just a faster way to work and a, and a smarter way to define our properties. Um, Figma tokens is the most popular Figma plugin for design tokens. Um, they help designers generate um, that, those base tokens and that JSON output. Um, they can then sync that JSON uh, through JSON bin or GitHub, which is what we use, um, and push that JSON up to the actual web design system. Um, so we can see here, we have our, our base tokens defined, we can see the color set, and then we can see that translated to the tokens. Um, the creators, creators of Figma tokens um, recently released, released a base theme that is supercharged with design tokens. Um, the, the theme is relatively inexpensive and uh, really allows you to, to dig in and see how uh, Figma tokens can be used. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get started, um, and this is a great way to see uh, how it's being used actively. Um, this is just a really cool example um, of, I'm actually in Cabana right now, um, and I can see, you know, here we're looking at several car components. Uh, one cool thing they're introducing is both a light and dark theme, which I think is a really interesting um, perspective there. We're seeing more and more browsers and devices switching to light mode or dark mode, so maybe when we're designing something, we should account for that as well. Uh, we can see here, uh, I can jump into the Figma Tokens plugin, I can toggle on my dark theme. As I do that, all of my components, my compositions, all change to that dark mode, and we can see, it takes a little bit, because all the tokens are, are firing, but we can see as I click maybe a sub-theme of dark, how all of those components pick up those tokens. I can see what that sub-theme looks like for my accent colors backgrounds, and then I can toggle on the JSON and see what that output would look like when I send that to my development team. Um, so here's my uh, second to last slide, or my penultimate slide. Um, so we just pulled together some uh, plugins of choice. Um, we've seen a few of these already, Figma tokens, Able, uh, things like that. A few others I wanted to point out is the downsize module uh, plugin. Um, sometimes we're working with a huge design system, a lot of compositions, we have a lot of imagery icons being used. Um, this downside plugin allows us to globally downsize all the images we're using to really uh, make that file much smaller and faster perform it. Um, export comments is another one that I've run into that I, I use a lot. Um, while we want to keep all the uh, feedback and comments in Figma, um, this plugin's a great tool if the client wants to have all the comments exported into like a spreadsheet or something like that. Um, it's one click, you generate an Excel document, you can use it as a Google spreadsheet, whatever, and, and keep everything there as well. All right, um, thank you. How are we doing on time? Um, pretty good. Uh, I would like to open up for questions. For the most part, there are some that are, um, they allow some features when you install it, but then, you know, if you want like the upgraded features, they're like, hey, give us five bucks or something. So like, they're pretty inexpensive, but um, some of them do have a cost for them. So 
so in terms of like the larger and smaller artboards? Yeah, yeah. We're just using pixels, but what we do is we're defining all of those breakpoints. So like I'll have my headings folder and then I'll have my various device folders as well for all those different sizes. So there'll be like an H2, um, maybe there might be like a jumbo H1, then there's like a standard H1 and then we, we size all of those down. So on those individual devices, I'm just using those, those mobile specific ones. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say um, with those different rounds of revisions, typically what I'd recommend if you, if you want to keep work, working in the same file, sometimes it might make sense when you share a bunch of design compositions, maybe globally like detaching the instance of those components. That way if you like change something, um, you can always keep that share link and that will just be the share link forever. Um, and then you can keep like having more rounds where you're working with live components. So I would just like, duplicate all of them, say round two, keep those components live because you're iterating those, and then like keep the round one locked in. That way someone can see, oh, where were we before? What did these designs look like before? If you change the live component, you'll change that design too. So that's a common problem that we run into too, so I just recommend like detaching those instances. That way you lock those artboards in, and, you, and each round you just share a different link. And oftentimes clients like to keep it like a living link, and we keep iterating, they don't even, Maybe we export all the all of them as flat PDFs just to like keep a timestamp on those. We just keep iterating the same file over and over. We organize them in like pages and sections. So like we'll have a section dedicated to those that des those design documentation sheets that you saw, um, and those evolve over time. We don't we don't make rounds of those, um, and then the individual pages is where we lock in. So we clearly label those. So like if I jump in, I can say like look at this. This is the final approved compositions. So it's really all about communicating within the app and and the labeling you're doing. Yep, in the back. To edit um, like the boot, so yeah. you basically installed, I, I couldn't hear you that well, um, but you installed like a Bootstrap 5 based theme in Figma, um, which gives you like a library of components you can then use, right? Um, and you're asking um, how you work with that? Mm -hmm. I would say the benefits to that is um, Bootstrap is a web framework, so um, your development team is going to, like, if they, they know you're using that kit, they, they install Bootstrap on their end and they start working with those core components and then you're modifying, like, the treatments of those components and the code, the output of the code doesn't change, it's just really just CSS and how you're manipulating the actual components. So there is value to that. Um, in our case, we're using Outline as that framework but of web components, but you could use Bootstrap or uh, foundation or something like that. We're moving away. Storybook is essentially our pattern lab. A few years, I would say. It's taken a while, and it's it's still evolving. Honestly, like um, what I showed today could be slightly different tomorrow. Um, we're we're constantly improving it based based on our need for project to project. So, um, I might find that I need to add more documentation on particular components. Um, the 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 cool part is is once I do that, I can replicate that on other projects moving forward. 
So it's evolving, but I would say it's taken a few years to kind of evolve it to this point. Yeah, so um, the value of outline, it's platform agnostic. So again, I'm looking at Storybook and I'm just seeing the HTML and CSS output, no Twig at all. So um, I can translate that to a React app, I can translate that to Drupal. It doesn't matter what I'm building at the end of the day. Um, what I'm seeing in Storybook is just the web component um, that I would then be injecting what I need for React or Drupal into it. So it, it wouldn't be like Pattern Lab, which is entirely Twig-based, um, and would only work with Drupal or a Twig-based system. It would it can be work, applied anywhere, and we've already done that on several projects. Any other questions? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true. Um, I keep things very basic. I would say I want to I I want to define my my core interactions. So, um, you know, those like button interactions. Maybe the image zooms a little bit when I hover over something. So really subtle things like that. Um, and if I decide to do like a video background or a transition, I might pull that into principle and do that like as a one off. Um, that way, I can say here's more of a drastic animation, but Let's look at the design file and interact with it, but more like prototyping menus and things that I'd have to like click or hover on to activate, as opposed to a lot of flashy things in the background in Figma. Thank you. Hmm? Yes. Okay, in, into Figma directly. Um, I would. <laughs> uh, I definitely encourage you to go to the booth and talk to Jake. <laughs> I'm going to completely defer that question to Jake, and he can he can illustrate that process. Um, as a, from the design standpoint, I get shared a, a staging link or a, or a storybook instance link, and I look at a component and test it there and compare it to what I built in Figma. Um, in terms of how that's done, I I would ven <laughs> venture to say that we have our outline components. We do our base install of that. We start modifying that and pulling the code into uh, Storybook. It basically, Storybook's a, a way that we communicate back and forth from Figma to Outline. Um, eventually, with Figma tokens, we'd love that to be automated, yes. That's kind of where we want to go. Um, and by using the JSON output, we could communicate and say, oh, this border radius changed, or this color changed subtly. No need to the developer even be involved. It's just done. Um, yes and no. I would say, like, for sure from a standpoint of, like, I know all of the components they're working on. I know their methodologies and, like, what questions they're going to ask me. Um, I actually was coming from a place where I would design and have to build myself. So I was using a lot of the things like Bootstrap um, myself to, to build out those components. Um, so I'm less involved in the actual, like, coding of things. But ha knowing, like, how those components are structured out of the gate in outline, I know like kind of what I can do and, and not do, or what I can do and then say, hey, developer, I know I'm extending this component functionality, but here's how I think we could modify it or add a new component, for example. So it does make it easier in that regard. It's not like a guessing game of like, how are we gonna build this thing? How is it gonna be coded? It's, we kind of have an idea already. Um, right there? Um, so, so Zeppelin, um, you could upload a Figma file and then, um, I, I don't use it too much, but I know that you could upload Figma and that allows developers to kind of define the tokens that way. Um, so technically, yes, because we could like mold Ze Zeppelin to work with our web components. Yep. 
Um, outline would be really beneficial for headless, yes, because again, it's platform agnostic, so um, it's really just JS with HTML and CSS output. No. Would it be hard to implement? We're getting out of my element here. <laughs> Any other questions? I will be at the booth um, after this if you want to come and, and chat. Um, and then again, Jake will be talking at line. So any technical questions, like he can really answer those. Um, I'd just be answering them the best I could and maybe give you the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs>